Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. This is Anthony. And this is James. We're going to talk about one of our favorite new movie studios, A24. They've been making a lot of great, provocative, and weird, eerie, terrifying films over the last nine, eight years. I think they were founded in 2013. And we're going to talk about specifically some of their horror films. So we're going to talk about The Witch, Hereditary, Green Room, Killing of a Sacred Deer, Enemy, Under the Skin, The Lighthouse, Midsummer, It Comes at Night, Tusk, a ghost story. A24 is an excellent studio, and they started out just mainly in distribution, and they were a distributor for about five or six years, and then as they were making money, especially with movies like Hereditary, they were able to start help produce films, so they uh, are producing and distributing now. So they started out with just distribution, but because they were such great tastemakers and curators of the films they bought and ended up distributing across theaters and they signed deals with Amazon. I think that the th the three people who run the company have really great taste, and they're also interested in in putting films out there that are kind of lost in modern eras, like like you said, strange films out of the ordinary films, films that were like kind of you you would expect to be made in like the '70s or '80s, but not really anymore. And I just really love the voice that they voices they've given to a lot of these great new upcoming filmmakers. Yeah, and plus they have an Oscar winning best picture under their belt with Moonlight. So they've done a lot of great films that aren't horror that are also just incredible stories and appealing not just horror, but you know, even films like The Lobster. It's not a horror movie, but like the entire tone of that film just fits the studio so well because of obviously the the director um, Lanthim with your ghost Lanthimos. Lanthimos. And Sorry. they have that amazing looking horrific. It doesn't look like straight horror, like surrealist horror with Lamb that's coming out soon. We're very excited to see um, with Numi Rapace. And that looks like a wild movie. And oh, yeah, I, I love their marketing campaigns too, the way they market their films. Very artistic. And also they have like a great clothing line and merch line as well. Pretty we gotta hit. get up, we gotta get on their level. Because they, they do the Safety Brothers movies as well. So yeah. they did uncut gems in uh Good time. Good time. So they're very hip with like the whole new Brooklyn street style and stuff like that, bro. That's right, kid. Yes. But anyways, before we continue, the best way to support our show, Raiders of the Lost Podcast, is to share us with your family and friends and become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Patrons get perks like personalized videos, podcast schedules. Top tier patrons get a shout, a shout out on the podcast every month, which we just did last episode. The best perk of all is every patron, $2, $5, or $10 tiers have access to our weekly bonus episodes of the podcast, which post every Wednesday. Head on over to our website, RaidersOfLostPodcast.com. Check out all of our stuff. Follow, subscribe, wherever you're listening. Hit the notification bell. Thank you so much for tuning in around the world. And we're just huge fans of the taste of their films. And I think that you were the first person to start showing me movies that were coming out from A24 for sure, like you have shown me most movies. <laughs> <laughs> As I was just drawn to them initially with uh, Ari Aster's first film, Green Room was an early one. Enemy is probably the first one I saw from A24. Um, and then I just fell in love with everything they've done. They they rarely miss. They hit a lot of home runs. And I just really love the power they've given to these great filmmakers. And it has to do with the people who run this company clearly love film for, yeah. for real. But they do have some misses. But you have to. There are when misses, you're taking yeah. swings at everything that's coming out of, in terms of ideas for scripts and stories and characters, you're going to have a couple duds, which they do. But for sure... They have a lot of really good movies, and so I figure we should just start with The Witch because that one's just an amazing horror film, and since it's October, spooky season, we're doing some of their horror movies. It might be And we're their, from Boston. We're from Boston, kid. It might be their best horror film that they've produced. I love The Witch. It was so original when it came out. It was jaw-dropping, and it was so shocking as well. I love how small the scale of it is. That's why it really works. Robert Eggers is a smart filmmaker where everything he writes is set in... A small location like for example this is mainly just set in the woods they built a, a little house and that's the set and then they go in the woods a few times and also with the lighthouse they just built the lighthouse and then that's the set you know what i mean so he's smart with keeping production costs down he can make the filmmaking great and hire great actors this is also anya taylor joy's first breakout role and she's become a very talented actor and i really love this story i love the dialogue with that old time english um classical english and then just the setting uh, we grew up in Massachusetts, and you know Salem witch hunts were were from there. We uh, we have it's an annual thing. Yeah. We we hunt witches every year. <laughs> yeah. It always happens. We burn them. We burn them and drown them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you grew up in Salem is is near us where we grew up. So like uh, 
fall, Halloween, spooky season is actually very big for New England. It's huge in Massachusetts for sure. And we love was... pumpkin patches. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and haunted hay rides. <laughs> and uh, this came out in 2018, directed by Robert Eggers. And it's a start. It's about a family in, ni- in 1630s New England who is torn apart by the forces of witchcraft, black magic, and possession. And again, starring Anya Taylor-Joy, who is phenomenal in this movie. It's just this psychological gutting and disturbing film. It's a slow burn for sure. I think Eggers is one of our most exciting young horror filmmakers working today. Like he's got that and he's got the lighthouse both on this list and then like Ari Aster and then Jordan Peele. Those are probably like my two, my three favorite right now at the moment. This movie's also, it's pretty polarizing. There are a lot of different interpretations about how it ends, but I love Eggers approach where it's, it's like a very realistic approach to what, if witches were like really around in this era of this like colonial New England town, like how they thought they really were. And it just really is, it's super grounded. It makes you feel like you're part of the family. You're, you're, it feel, makes you feel like you've also been banished. You've been exiled from this colonial town because of the the sins of your father, you could say, and you're all being punished for that. And it's about betrayal, temptation. Thomaston played by Anya Taylor-Joy. She's being basically tempted by the by Satan to uh, basically go to the dark side. And it's, it's really fascinating. It, it's an origin story for a witch. Like how, which is how, origins. <laughs> which is origins. How a witch would become a witch. And it's really fascinating. You've never seen that take on it. And there's some really horrific imagery. Like the first time you saw saw the witch like bathing in blood, you're like, oh my God, the music is great. It, it's very much like the Stanley Kubrick's music that he used in 2001. Um, those That choir work that slowly rises and rises. And also this movie feels a lot like, you know, things like The Crucible, where it's that paranoia that people in this era felt of uh, being, of the fear of being point, pointed out as a witch or the fear of being a, a, around other witches. And, you know, there's no such thing as like real science back then for these simple folks. So uh, anything unexplainable or out of the ordinary was chalked off to, oh, must be witchcraft. And I don't know how many people were killed because of being accused of being witches and also of being uh, vampires as well. It was like a real phenomenon of paranoia in this area and also in Europe where people were just dying just because some they did something wrong or someone uh, spread a rumor about them. And it was just as simple as that. Yeah, and the film is very... And also, I'm sorry, the, the, the worst part about it was in order to save themselves, many people admit it to being witches because they were they would be spared if they admitted oh I'm a witch they would the, the town would spare them but then that would um, make people really believe that witches were real if people were admitting to being witches that like pretty much solidified the idea that they were real yeah I mean the average IQ of someone in the 1630s probably wasn't super high you're not that well educated like today we're so lucky that most of us have access to very solid education in terms of what people have had before 1920 you could say and the, the, the film basically follows this family who's exiled from this colonial town and it's about them just like surviving on their own and kind of losing their sanity in a way. And it's it's a really interesting film with the family being torn apart by each other with, with Anya Taylor-Joy's character, Thomason, who when they start the film, she's like a very devout Catholic. She's praying constantly. She seems to be very upset that her and her family are being exiled. She doesn't want to leave the community. And and this is it's not her fault that she has to leave. It's her father's actions that caused him to have to leave, and he decides for them to go. And then her transformation from, you know, being a very devout religious person to then accepting Satan into her life by the end of the film and committing matricide and the death of basically everyone in her family towards at, by the end of the film. It's in, it's shocking. Yeah, and embracing the darkness, and then it's just got that f- fantastic finale where she joins the other witches during their ritual. In the around the, that campfire, and then she slowly starts rising into the air, and she just starts like enjoying it. She looks like she's experiencing euphoria of some kind, mm-hmm. and she's just laughing uh, maniacally. And it's just what a what a terrific ending to the movie. It was so jaw dropping and surprising. And I just I saw it in theaters, and I was I was just blown away by it. Yeah, it's not for everybody. the The tone it's of very the film slow. is it's dark, yeah. it's grim, it's always cloudy and wet. It seems like and. It's, you know, the dialogue is very classical English, so sometimes it's kind of hard to uh, follow what they're saying. And they also speak like very biblically. So dialogue accurate to the times. But I think if people aren't 
aren't accepting of that or they don't want to listen to something like that, it might be hard for them to watch this You got to open yourself up to films like this. Yeah. A24 is full of films open that you just have to up. open your heart to the film, accept what's happening, and just go with it, especially like movies like A Ghost Story and, and Enemy. You know, they're, they're not movies that are for everybody to watch. And some people, you know, they, they walk out of theaters when they see movies like this, but we loved it when we saw it in theaters. How dare you walk out of a theater? I've never done it. I've never I don't think it. I have. I've thought about it. When? When we were watching Malignant, oh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, should yeah. we leave within 20 minutes? But then it got good. <laughs> good thing you stayed. It's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> All right. Want to move on to our next one? Let's do it. Next up, we have Hereditary, which came out in 2018, directed by Ari Aster. A grieving family is haunted by tragic and disturbing occurrences. And we actually featured this on an episode where we pinned it with Midsommar. And it's just an excellent horror film. Ari Aster was a dynamic new voice in the genre of horror. And Toni Collette gives one of the best performances of the last few years. She's absolutely incredible. And this movie is just such a great, tight, slow burn of a thriller. It's horrific. It's engrossing. And the acting is sensational. It's got some of the most terrifying scenes I've seen recently. Yeah. Definitely check out our, our longer in-depth episode of it when we paired it with Midsummer. We also did it uh, last year in a modern horror film episode because it's such a great film to talk about. We've seen it like, we watched this a bunch when we were watched kids. watched this a bunch when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Ari Aster is in my top three right now of, of young ho horror directors. Young hot directors. <laughs> young hot directors. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't wait to see his new film that's going to be starring Joaquin Phoenix. And in Hereditary, it's, it's incredible. This movie blew my mind. It's really, in my mind, is one of the best of this like current modern era of horror where I like, like I said, a couple episodes, I think we're in the best era of horror of all time where every, so many studios are killing it with their movies and there's so many great new ideas. And this one's incredible because yeah, we've seen like the, the possession movies before and we've seen Satan coming up or, or a, a devil coming up and or like a satanic somebody person winning and yeah. cults and stuff yeah. like that. But Ari does it in such a unique way and he creates this this claustrophobic effect with this family where you're you're spending a lot of time with them in their house and you feel like you're part of this this these cults that are going on and these mysteries behind the entire family plus he he does the great aesthetic of metaphorically and symbolically showing what's going on through Tony Collette's character's mind constantly with the the miniatures that she's making and things like that and the relationships between it's it, at at the heart of it. It's also about just a family and their relationships with each other. And when this great tragedy happens, when the son is responsible for the death of the daughter, horrifically, when Oof. she gets beheaded by a telephone pole sticking her head out the window because Ouch. she's having an allergic reaction to peanuts, which she should not be having at that party. It's actually walnuts. <laughs> oh yeah, walnuts. I'm Jesus. sorry. <laughs> Did you even see the film? <laughs> Can you believe what I'm working with? And so, like, the realism of, like, what would, what would happen to a family if that really happened? And, and focusing on that because even though later on, the, towards the end of the film, we see that, like, there's so many hints and clues where the cult kind of wanted all these things to happen. But still, I love how Ari focuses a lot on the family relationships after the events that happen. Then also, we get to the cult in the third act. And also... There have been so many possession movies in the last 20 years. It's definitely been an influx in the horror genre of the possession film. And there's always exorcisms or some kind of exorcism. And I think Ari was really smart by being like, I'm not going to get a priest in this movie at all. I'm not going to hey, do an right. exorcism. I'm not going to be like, we got to get rid of this demon or this thing that's possessing my son. He was like, I'm... That's all been done a thousand times, and it's the same thing over and over again. So I think that by eliminating that from the story, he already had something unique in terms of the possession film. Yeah, instead he has the family embracing this sort of spiritual presence that's going on until they find out that it's actually a demon named Paimon. Yeah. Paimon, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, geez, I, did you, are you the host of a podcast or what? <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. People make mistakes. I mean, they do. <laughs> well, that was a complete reverse. Immediately, you're usually not that repentful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I like how they they do the si the si seance science seance seance. Are you even a psychological <laughs> paranormal <laughs> fanatic? I'm not. <laughs> they do the science seance seance. <laughs> I can't say it. They do the thing, <laughs> and it's got again a great ending. I love movies where evil wins and evil is victorious. You're so sinister. No, it's just. Are you sure you're not Slytherin? 
<laughs> I should be, honestly, but I'm, I'm Ravenclaw. I guess I'm too smart to be in Slytherin. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, all these smart people are in Ravenclaw. Sounds like someone's jealous. <laughs> I'm not jealous. I'm happy. I see with... you have the green light on you. It's just, it came out naturally. Bathed in, in Slytherin I tried green? To, I tried to change the light behind me, but it just keeps flickering back on green. You gotta get a snake for your desk. I should. Yeah. I'll speak parcel tongue to it. <laughs> like a Wasn't real... a witch wizard who turned bad who wasn't in Slytherin? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's get back on topic to hereditary. <laughs> But I mean, the the ending is unbelievable. It's like insane that finale when Tony Collette's character is chasing him through the house and then you know chopping off her own head with the piano wire. Ugh. It's just once it gets going, it's in it's unbelievable. This movie reminds me so much of Rosemary's Baby. It feels like that quality of filmmaking and sort of the the effect it had on me in terms of you know evil prevailing and no matter what the characters did, the protagonists did in the end. A demon was born on Earth. It's crazy. It comes. Paimon enters Peter's body and yeah. becomes a. He's part human now, and he's on this Earth, and he'll eventually learn. And I love the ending because even though it's a demon on Earth now, it's so like such a positive and like feel to it. And yeah. the, the lighting, the music warm, is really music. great. It's it like seems, it's like M eighty three inspiring music. It feels like a happy ending, even though it's one of the most evil things, or probably the most evil thing that could happen to humanity. Which is so ironic. Yeah, it's, and it's also like the almond as well when um, Damien survives at the end. Absolutely love this film, and we've talked about it, I think, three times now, four times. So check out our other episodes, more in-depth discussion Very in on depth. Hereditary. We did like an hour on, on each that in like we got real and We got real deep in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on <laughs> to a film that I went into completely blind. You recommended this to me, and it blew me away. Green Room, directed by Jeremy Soliner. Came out in 2016. It's about a grieving family. No, it's not. That's the wrong <laughs> synopsis. That's the wrong synopsis. I'm sorry. This is, sorry. Anthony was in charge of the synopsis this time. And for for example, for under director of Enemy, he put Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I was watching King Kong while I was making the list. And so for some reason, I just wrote Peter Jackson. <laughs> so I wrote, Are you were you high when you wrote this in the notes? Because it's a Google Doc. But anyways, I'll just, I'll wing the, the synopsis. Well, you've seen it. I think you can yeah. handle it. So it's about a band that is, it's just a, a young band, a punk rock band. They're basically touring these small dive places around the country in America and you know they they play at this basically Nazi bar Aryan um, Brotherhood bar yeah, yeah. and um a, a metal bar yeah. and so they're playing music but what they're playing is the kind of music they're playing is anti Nazi music and even the titles of the of the lyrics are Nazi punks Nazi punks and it obviously makes them go crazy so they end up getting trapped inside the green room and in this back and forth battle between the people who run the entire joint, which are this Aryan Brotherhood Nazi group, versus this band kind of trapped in the green room. The green room is the the area where bands and comedians and performers hang up before they go on stage. This movie is insane, and the gore is great. The tension is unbelievable, uh, and I think that horror really works when you're in a like a single location. I think it works really well, like this situation where. It, you don't leave this bar at all. The whole film is take, takes place here, and that's its strength. And then you have an excellent villain in Patrick Stewart. I think, for me, Patrick Stewart always needed a role like this yeah. in his career. He, he plays this sadistic, ruthless, Nazi Aryan Brotherhood leader, and he is just fantastic, totally believable in the role. I mean, he goes from being one of the most likable actors a alive to being this horrible villain and i just really adored him in this role and i think that it's something he had to do yeah this movie unfortunately didn't make a ton of money i think on a budget of five mil it only make four yeah. four million dollars so it was actually not a successful film. i don't think it was m marketed perfectly i don't think anyone knew what it was yeah i don't think uh, people were too aware of it and this but, was 2016 so a24 is still kind of young and yeah. it's not like the word of mouth like oh the new a24 movies coming out we gotta check out that trailer and go see the movie my guess is they probably didn't have the marketing budget that they do have now to, to promote their films but this is a loved movie. Like people request this all the time, and people are always like, "Have you seen Green Room?" And I'm, I'm always like, "Oh yeah, it's insane." And I recommend it to people because I think that people aren't even aware of it as being a great horror film, but it is terrifying. It's one of those movies that I think in like the hardcore horror fan genre, all horror fans know this movie. Yeah, they're the people that went to see it and who watch it regularly. 
And it's and also because it doesn't have like a monster or yeah, a demon. Yeah, exactly. It's not a supernatural. It's not a monster movie. It's a human monster movie. Like the humans are the monsters in this film. And what also in addition to taking place in one location, it takes place over a very short period of time. It's yeah. like what, like a ten it's hour almost, window? Yeah, it's almost it's real like time. One night yeah. to an early morning, probably what it feels like. And and uh, it also stars Anton Yelchin. R.I.P. What a what a career that guy would have had. He was such a phenomenal actor. He, he would have been in some great movies the last five years. And then uh. Imogen Poots, who he also starred with in Fright Night a couple of years after, or a couple of years before this, um, and also Joe Cole, aka John Shelby, is in this film as well. He's part oh, of the band. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. them three and someone else are in this band, and when they get when they start playing this song at this Nazi bar, I don't think they'd understood where they were. Yeah. And then the music and the lyrics started pissing off all the people in, that were in the crowd and everything. But and, especially like the hardcore guys. Yeah. And they're the ones who band together and decide to kill them. Yeah, so they just, they want to kill them and they're trapped inside this green room. And it's just a back and forth of trying to figure out a way to get out of this building, even though you're in this green room, which essentially, it's like in the center of the entire structure of yeah. the bar. And there's only one door out. Yeah. There's one way out and it's a hallway that they're all there waiting for you to come out. And they're surrounded by Nazis. And they, <laughs> they all have guns. They yeah. don't have any weapons or anything. And they're constantly get wounded and it's really it's really interesting how they're trying to they get out a few times only to be run to run back inside they get out only to go back inside they get a weapon they get a shotgun but they still get pushed back inside and they suffer a ton of wounds and injuries but it's it's really gory the violence is very graphic it's it's pretty hardcore there are some some shots that'll make your stomach churn for sure in this movie but i really adore this i think that the director jeremy solnier he really knocked this out of the park. I haven't seen anything. I don't think he's made a film since this, but it's if he has, correct me if I'm wrong, but if he hasn't, I'd really love to see him make another movie because he really did a fantastic job. Yeah, the theme I love about it is fight or flight. Are you going to survive? And it's basically a survival horror film just like yeah. The Thing. Yeah. You know, that's what's so cool about it. It's exactly. an awesome movie if you haven't seen it. Mm. We didn't even spoil the ending on that one. Great job. Yeah. Sorry, we're, if we we're do, doing a great job. If we do spoil other films, we're really sorry about that, but we're assuming y'all have seen most of these. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is one of my favorites on the list. It might be my favorite. Um, Killing of a Sacred Deer, which came out in 2017, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, the great Greek director. Um, Stephen, a charismatic surgeon, is forced to make an unthinkable sacrifice after his life starts to fall apart. When the behavior of a teenage boy is ta- he has taken over, he has taken under his wing, turns sinister and Yorgos is one of my favorite directors working today I love his style I love his tone no one makes movies like him no one writes screenplays like him he is like a a dark Wes Anderson is the closest thing you can can compare him to and one of my favorite movies he made it's called Dogtooth if you haven't seen it yeah check it out it was the uh, foreign language film nomination for Greece that year and that's what really put him on the map in terms of a filmmaker but Killing of a Secret Deer You've never seen anything like it. It's an unbelievable story. He takes a classical t- classical mythology like um, Robert Eggers does with The Lighthouse, and he puts it into a contemporary setting. And it's just got phenomenal performances. It's so shocking. It's so surprising. It's unpredictable. Unpredict- it's really funny at times, and the filmmaking is incredible. Yeah, I think instead of Wes, I would compare Yorgos more to Stanley Kubrick, maybe the closest thing we've had to him tonally with films in terms of creating this... He creates his own world, his own atmosphere. When you watch his movies, it feels like you're somewhere else. Like most movies you watch, you know, oh, this, you know, I'm watching a movie or I'm, you know, I recognize this world. But when you watch his movies, the tone just feels, it feels like it's on a different planet that they're filming. It's it's unsettling like a lot of Kubrick films are, like 2001, Eyes Wide Shut. They just have that feel to them that something's off. And, and it's, it's, you're right. You're it's like the techniques right. of the camera and the writing but and the It's the, the dialogue. It's yeah. the tone. It's, I, I think Clockwork Orange could be the closest yeah, thing Yeah, yeah, probably. It. The way people talk to each other in Clockwork Orange, it's very unnatural. And so that's what people talk. That's how people talk in his movies, except for the favorite, which is he didn't write; he just yeah. directed it. So his other films that he's written, it definitely feels. I would, but I still think he's like West because no one talks in real life like they do in a Wes Anderson movie, and no one talks in real life like they do in a Yorgos Lanthimos well, movie. Well, no one talks like they talk in Quentin Tarantino's movies. That's true, true. But the dialogue in both West and Yorgos is like very like well, flat because it's and they're it's, very like open and they talk about things that you wouldn't really share. The thing with Yorgos, I think his films, it's like a combination of like super dry satire yeah. with like macabre tragedy. You know, he's he walks that line constantly, which makes his film 
films hysterical, but also at the same time horrific. Like yeah. Dog Tooth, the first time I saw that, there are funny beats to that movie, but it is shockingly yeah. wild. It's disturbing. Same thing with The Lobster. Lobster is a very funny movie if you have a very dry sense of humor. So, like, I guess you're right. Like, with Wes, only Wes Anderson fans like his movies, you exactly. could say. He's got a lot of them, but, like, a lot of people that we hear from in comments or we see or talk to about his films, not huge fans of that humor. And I also think Yorgos, he, he, he rediscovered the talent of Colin Farrell because we in Bruges, he's amazing. Yeah, and fucking Bruges, in, in, in fucking Bruges. <laughs> but before in Bruges, he was kind of like teetering down. And with Yorgos, he made um, the lobster and then killing of a sacred deer. And since he started working with Yorgos, then will then Colin Farrell got Fantastic Beasts and a bunch of other really great big movies. And now he's in the Batman. And so I think Yorgos helped revitalize his career by showing filmmakers and showing audiences how talented he's always been extremely talented. I, I just think oh, that yeah. Colin's choices of movies in his past weren't very great, but now he's excellent with his roles. And the plot of this film is wild. So it's basically about uh, Colin Farrell plays Stephen, who is a surgeon. He's, he's a doctor. And a man dies under his knife during surgery. But then his... He's a heart surgeon. He's, yeah. And then his son, the son of the patient who died enters Steven's life and Steven tries to basically be like a father figure to like kind of make up for your father's death and the, the thing with Steven he doesn't even blame himself even though he's the he was, doctor he's drunk yeah he was he's, he's an alcoholic and yeah. he's operating but he still blames on like the anesthesiologist and stuff like he's like a doctor can't kill somebody yeah. it's the anesthesiologist but what's ha what happens is that you don't you don't see it happening at first but when you're halfway through the movie you realize that the son of the patient has cursed Colin Farrell's family to the point where all of his family members will die um, unless Colin Farrell, his character, chooses to kill one of them himself. I like how you said cursed. Yeah. Even though it, it's, it's a curse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a it's an obviously biological explanation with some sort of sickness. No, it's I think it's a real curse. Yeah, that's what you could think. Yeah. Oh, the, the way I the way I look at the movie is the the Billy coughs his character. He literally curses the family. Martin. Martin. Um, and he so I, they don't explain anything about his background, yeah, yeah. but I think somehow he has some kind of I don't know, supernatural or, you know, witchcraft kind of powers that they don't show, but he off clearly has. And I think that he has cursed the family. And they're actually a, there's actually a really great sign to it. In the cafe at the end, after the family's healed up, and then they meet Martin and they have that conversation. At the end or the, like... At the end. Okay, so after... Well, it's the cafe that he's been meeting with Martin at the, the entire film. So we've had several scenes there. There's a Blue Jay... On the wall there, I think it's. I actually even think it's called Blue Jay Cafe or something like that. And the Blue Jay is infamous for being a messenger for the devil in spiritual circles. That's pretty cool. So I think that Yorgos planted a little bits here and there to show that it could be like some kind of supernatural curse that he's put on the family. I just assume it's some sort of disease that he's given them and he has an answer to it. But maybe that that probably is true. Who no. knows? But um, what happens is Martin basically infiltrates this family. And, and then he starts to, you know, the kids start getting sick and then he basically is threatening Steve and to either kill a person in his family to set balance, to set right to their situation or everyone in your family is going to die and you have to choose. And he says, and, and I love the scene where he's eating the spaghetti and yeah, he's, oh he's my like, God. he's like, is this fair? No, but it's the only thing I can think of that's close to justice. And um, the, the actor, I believe his name is Billy Koff. He was in Dunkirk. He plays the the boy who gets the head injury and dies on the boat, and he's gonna be in the Eternals as well. He's in the Green Knight. Yeah, in the Green Knight too. This his performance in this movie is, without a doubt, one of the best of the last few years, in general. He's absolutely stunning in this movie, and he's he's Irish. You couldn't even tell it. His accent's perfect, and he also plays Martin like he's he seems like he's on the spectrum, or some kind of maybe he's slightly autistic. The way his manner is, the way he speaks. And I just think that this is one of the best performances that got so underlooked, uh, overlooked, I mean, and underappreciated. And if you guys, you guys check out, you gotta check out this movie. It's some of the best acting, honestly, I've seen in a while. Yeah, he's awesome. On he explodes on camera. You know, the camera loves him, and you know, he's really engaging for the audience. I think in terms of his nonverbal communication, that he's with his acting and everything, he's he's amazing. This film and, and the ending is incredible. Where. Steven has to do it. He has to take somebody out in his family. And if you if you don't want a spoiler, I would just fast forward like a, a, like 15, 30 seconds <laughs> where he they all sit in the in the living room in a circle around Steven and he wears a blindfold. It reminds me of funny games. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. And then uh, he just does a circle with a gun and pulls the trigger when he stops and he kills his son. 
Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's such a crazy movie. If you haven't seen it, you got to check it out. It's, it's absolutely incredible. I believe it's on Netflix. And he based it on the fable um, of Agamemnon with the killing of a sacred deer. And that's where it's a Greek tale as Agamemnon, king of Mycenae, finds himself forced to sacrifice his eldest daughter, Iphigenia, <laughs> to Artemis, goddess of the hunt, after accidentally killing a sacred deer. There we go. Now, let's hit an, into... Head on into our intermission. I can't talk today. I feel like I can never talk anyways. That's true. Like I wasn't born to talk into a microphone. Anyways, let's- But uh, yet, here you are. Here we are. I know. It's <laughs> kind of weird how life works out sometimes. Let's do our movie cool competition, starting with one from a fan, then one from me. This is from Tyler. It's uh, two characters going back and forth. So okay. pay, pay attention to this one, okay, Anthony? I'm paying attention. Pay attention. How do you feel? Taller. That's it. How do you feel taller? Who gets taller in a movie? It's kind of obvious. Oh man, I feel like it's gonna. I'm gonna hate myself for not getting it. I don't know. Captain America first. Oh Avenger, when yeah, he comes out of the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then this is from me. Why do I fall in love with every woman I see who shows me the least bit of attention? Is that her? No. Hmm. Is it 500 Days of Summer? No. Shoot. I don't know. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Oh. Joel. Joel. What are you taking photos of over there? I'm screenshotting the unsubscribers. Well, how, how about you put it on vibrate? I, I Oh, shit. <laughs> I thought I did. You can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. All right, your turn. Here's my quote. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Oh, um, gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. That's a funny line because it's so ironic. Um, what freaking movie is it? What movie has a big war room in it? Oh, it's uh, Doctor Strange Love. That's right. Yeah. Ding, 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 ding. Good job. How I fell in love with the atomic bomb. How I learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's close enough. It was pretty close, yeah. It was close. It was close enough. It was footnotes. It was, it was yeah, it was cliff notes. Yeah. Anyways, moving on to our guest this movie release year. Since it's spooky season, I decided to do Casper. Oh, Casper. That's a good one. Classic. 1996. Wrong. 95. Oh, man. Love that movie. We used to watch this a bunch when we were kids. <laughs> Watched it all the time when we were young. It's actually true. <laughs> <laughs> I have another, I have a ghost one too. Oh, because you know, spooky. it's spooky time. <laughs> Ghostbusters, the first one. That's 1980. It's either 81 or 84. Which one is it? 81 or 84. The second one, that had to have. Ah, uh, 81 or 84. 81 or 84. <laughs> 84. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Good one. That's like a Michael Scott thing, like how yeah. he remembers stuff like makes no sense at all. <laughs> Why is it either one of those? <laughs> I call it's an it's like an improvised conversation. Baldy, <laughs> <laughs> your name's Mike. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, movie pop quiz time. If you don't get this one right, you're gonna be very upset. What was the name of the infamous fishing boat used in the shark hunt in Jaws? Oh man. You're going to be so upset. Oh, man. Oh, no. I can't think of it. <laughs> Hold on. Give me a sec. Take your time. No one's doing anything besides living their lives waiting for you to get this right. <laughs> <laughs> someone's on the treadmill. Someone's in the car in traffic. I know, it's, like I know it's only like five letters. Come on, Anthony. Jeez. <laughs> oh, I'm busy. Man. I got to do stuff. <sighs> I surrender. The orca. Oh, my God. Orca, big letters on the back of the boat. Yeah, I'm an idiot. I love that movie too. It's like your favorite movie. I told you you'd hate yourself. I thought you'd get it. I really did. Oh, well, guess you're not that smart after all. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my quiz. What two movies did Gene Hackman win Oscars for? Conversation. And ah, can I guess more? Okay, okay. oh no. The French Connection, he definitely won. Yes. Um. What else did he win for? Okay, one more guess. Oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> I can see you perspiring. See, it's definitely not the replacements. <laughs> <laughs> um. 
Um, Gene Hackman movies. Gene Hackman movies. I I doubt he he didn't get one for Crimson Crimson Tide. He's really good in that movie. Maybe Crimson Tide. Ah, uh, oh, what was it? Unforgiven. Oh my god! <laughs> wow, I love yeah. that movie. Yeah. So good. All right, who we got for biggest haters of the week? We got a few, a few good ones. So there's a there's a real one. <laughs> I posted a clip about Batman's bat symbol in the Batman with Pattinson and how it's um, clearly broken down from either a knife or a gun. Yeah, it's definitely the handgun yeah. grip. And the symbol is made from, he, he cut the pistol in half and made the symbol out of that. And then Oskia J said, so many words that could have just been one full sentence. So I said, get out of here. Get out of here, guy. <laughs> it's a podcast. Relax, man. Jeez, I can't say two sentences. It's an interesting, fun oh fact. Oh, my God. Actually, it's hard. You can't explain that with one sentence. Yeah, There's you, a lot goes into that. There needs to be more than one sentence to explain that. Yeah. It's a 30-second clip. That guy was just pissed. He, he, a lot of people don't like themselves, man. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Yeah. You should love yourself, everybody. Yeah. So I'm, I actually feel bad for him. I do, too. I, I have nothing but empathy for, for people yeah. like that. Yeah. I pity them. All right. Anyways, that, that, but he's a loser. I pity the fool. <laughs> Next up, we have Hamza Islam. He commented on our Horror Icons episode, Why wasn't this longer? Unsubscribed. <laughs> Can I also say that you said you pity him, but he's also a loser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they both can be true. <laughs> also, here we go. On our Venom episode, our kit comedy said, "Bro, I can't believe you said M and M's are bad, and I thought you were cool." Unsubscribe. Hey, 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 let me let me correct that. I didn't say M and M's were bad. I peanut M and M's are my favorite candy. What I'm saying, what I meant was the quality of the chocolate in M and M's isn't that great as opposed to something you can get at like a good store. Or something uh -huh. you know what I mean, uh -huh. like sure. a chocolate shop. Sure. That sure. chocolate's way better. This is mass produced factory chocolate. It's it's good. But I just meant the quality of the M and M's chocolate isn't as high as like you know like a seventy two percent cacao that you get at Whole Foods or something like that. Okay, I, I yeah, that's what I, I meant. Think you're, I agree. With I you should have sure. clarified. I remember when I was saying that someone's. I was like, someone's gonna come at me about M and M's. <laughs> love them. I love M and M's. You hate them? Love them. But the chocolate again. You love peanut M and M's though, dude. That's my yeah, my life source. <laughs> could be. <laughs> I could tell. I can attest to that. And then my. My favorite comment was Joe the Bouncer. I, I made a French Dispatch clip, and then Joe the Bouncer wrote, I've been trying to remember Adrian Brody's name for like three now, three months now. Thanks, bro. <laughs> Although not enough to actually look it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Everyone does that. Like there's something in your head that you can't get right that you're yeah. thinking about for months, then it finally hits. Yeah, it's, it clicks. And you, just, you could just look it up yourself. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> All right. That cracked me up. We have a big supporter this week, and it's from Raina Lane. She left a wonderful five-star review. Love from El Paso. You guys are the first thing I listen to in the mornings, uh. and you always make my day. I've been a film fanatic since childhood, and listening to you guys banter about film is the best way to wake up. Please keep what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much, Raina. That was the sweetest great, review. That's a sweet review. Wow, I'm very touched. That you, makes me you so made, happy. You made our day. You made it, yeah. That's you made our week. Hopefully, you're listening to us right now in the morning, and you're hearing yourself on the podcast. So that's good pretty, morning. Good morning, right now. <laughs> How's the coffee? <laughs> you have a great day. <laughs> oh, don't forget your keys. <laughs> All right. On this day in film and TV history, or film history, October 11th, in 1975, Saturday Night Live, created by Lorne Michaels, premieres on NBC with George Carlin as a host. Did you did you see that they have a forty seven year record low on their last on their yeah, season premiere? Their premiere was the worst ratings they've ever had. They it's might shocking. Yeah, that that show might not last. They need to start reworking with the way they're doing that show because I honestly that have, is not good news. I haven't been able to watch it for a few years. It hasn't been funny it hasn't, at all. Yeah, it hasn't been funny. The, in a long time. the last five episodes I've watched, I haven't laughed one moment. It, I think I laughed a few times just because the host, whoever it was, that was awesome, that I love, like yeah. did something funny. But that's because, like, I think I laughed at the Elon Musk one a few times because it's Elon Musk yeah, hosting. Yeah. But like, that show is that was a terrible episode. Though. Not funny. That was actually one of their best episodes, I'd say, that year. It was horrible. That's what I mean. The best one was the Wario sketch, and that wasn't even funny. Man, it's it's really bad. It's, yeah, they just need. To, I think they need to change their their approach to the comedy. I think so too. But anyways, happy birthday to Luke Perry. And my streaming recommendation Curious. is Squid Game. Oh, this yeah. show lives up to the hype. I, f I finally got around to watching it. Anthony's halfway through it. We're going to do an episode on it soon. It is insane. 
It's thought provoking. It's highly engaging. I was wrapped in within within 35 minutes, 40 minutes of the first episode. One of the craziest things I've ever seen on TV in my life, and I was just hooked immediately. Yeah, it's really it really is great, and I can see why so many people are in love with it now. It's a it's a really interesting show and very shocking and surprising. Yeah, I got one episode left. I'm almost done. I'll oh probably, wow, you burn through them. Might bang it out tonight or tomorrow, but man, it's really good. I recommend it, and it's on Netflix. My streamer was just on added on Amazon Prime is Thirteen Assassins which is a great modern samurai movie. It's kind of like a, a cousin to, um, the seven, Asa- to seven Samurai, where these 13 men assemble to protect a village from an in- invading uh, commander. And the sword fighting is so epic in this. It's really some like some of the best ever done because of, you know modern filmmaking has improved the ability of stunt work. And so if you love samurai movies and you love action, check out 13 Assassins. Let's dive back into our A24 Studio horror episode and be, and continue with Enemy, which came out in 2013. According to Anthony, this was directed by Peter Jackson. <laughs> However, it was actually directed by Denis Villeneuve, the great French-Canadian director who's got Dune coming out, <laughs> Dune reference for the day. And it's about a man who seeks out his exact lookalike after spotting himself in a movie. And this is loosely based on a novel called Double. And this is a movie that I still think about. It is amazing. I think it might have been the first Denis movie I had seen back in 2013. Um, I think we probably saw this together in theaters. And We watched I, it all the time when we were younger. Yeah, we watched it a bunch when we were kids. <laughs> I love this film. It's it's so thought-provoking. I love the surrealism elements of it, the, the themes in terms of cycles, and the acting by Jake Gyllenhaal is phenomenal. Um, the great uh, thematic metaphors of the spiders throughout the entire film as well. It's just such an interesting movie. Yeah, and his filmmaking is really excellent. Uh, this is all have this filmmaking has this like really great yellowish tint to it the yeah. entire time. And this is before he started working with Roger Deakins. He actually filmed this. This came out after Prisoners, but he filmed it before Prisoners. Oh wait, never mind. Oh yeah, wait. So what was the first movie that we saw by Denis? Prisoners was 2011. Prisoners. Yeah. Okay, I was wrong. Sorry. It's close enough. Yeah, yeah. Early, anyways. Well, the first one I saw of his was in Sanda, um, his his great great film. And but Enemy, the, I love the filmmaking. I love the symbolism. All the spire stuff's not in the novel, but he added it. And uh, I think Canada is a really fascinating place to set a movie. It, you can tell the it looks different from anywhere in America. And uh, Jake Gyllenhaal really blew me away with this. This is one of his better dramatic roles on his filmography. And made people look at him in a different way and also like like you said this movie sticks with you the ending is so bizarre and so thought-provoking so strange so is the opening uh, it's just it, you can like go crazy thinking about this movie and trying to figure it out and yeah. understand the symbolism and you can say that to bookend the yeah. film opening to ending because when he opens and he goes into that like underground club or whatever yeah. you could say with the spider being crushed and then the ending with him going inside to talk to his wife for a moment before he heads out and it's her wife is his wife has turned to a giant spider that's terrified to look at him and so it stars this character named um Adam. Anthony a- Anthony's the Anthony's the main one right, yeah. stars Anthony who's in a relationship who basically he wants out of, you know, his, his, his wife is pregnant and, or is his girlfriend or his wife? I can't remember. His girlfriend is Melina Laron. Yeah. And then the wife. Wait, hold on. Sorry. Yeah. I'm going to mix it up. So Adam. Sarah Gaddon's the wife. So Adam's the other version. Adam yeah. is the version who. The actor. Who. I thought Anthony was the actor. Oh, is it? Anthony's I'm, the I actor. I think I mixed you up. Yeah, yeah. I so mixed... I think I was right. So I mixed twins up. Anthony's, look at the, look okay. the irony. The Ready? irony. Anthony's the bad boy in this movie. <laughs> Anthony's the bad. Anthony's the motorcycle rider, the bad boy. The gotcha, one, gotcha. One, the, yeah, yeah. the one who wants to do all the, the nefarious things. And so Adam's yeah, the, yeah. the college professor, gives the lectures, um, and he's the one who has the the relationship with Melanie, with uh, what's her name? I'm sorry, Melanie Laron. Yeah. So, but he he's not. But An- but Anthony's the one with the wife and the pregnant yeah. the pregnant wife who he wants to leave and he's not happy with. Yeah. And then what happens is Adam he watches this old DVD of some random movie that his coworker recommended just on a whim because you know Aunt Adam needs some like laughter in his life. He yeah. seems like a depressed guy. He's totally lost and he watches this movie and he sees that. There's a bellhop extra who has like one line to say in the movie and he's just barely in the film at all. But he looks exactly like Adam. So much so that he becomes obsessed with finding this person. And then when he does find this person, he tracks him down and he, through his agency and then he discovers that where he lives 
and then he uh, then he finds that this person looks exactly like him and then they end up meeting and then that sets this whole conflict into motion but it's not even that he looks like him it's that he is him yeah. you know they have the same scar they have the same exact beard yeah but basically what this entire film is about i think it's it's really it's one person yeah he's going through some sort of dual personality disorder um, identity crisis ident yeah identity crisis split personality because his, because his apartment with his girlfriend it's empty there's like nothing there you can't tell that anyone even lives there there's like a bed and that's it it doesn't feel like a lived-in home. So it's definitely the place where he just goes to to see his girlfriend, yeah, his it's mistress. A, it's about infidelity and how he doesn't want to be trapped in this lifestyle of with this this is pregnant girlfriend, his pregnant wife, which is a terrible, selfish thing. Yeah. But, I mean, that's just what it is. That's, that's the motivation he, that's of the, the character. He, feels. he wants he, to be free. He feels trapped, yeah. as selfish as that is. That's yeah. basically his motivation to or, or what's breaking him down mentally. Yeah. It's not bad to say that. It's, yeah, I'm just, yeah, that's I'm just a, setting it yeah. clear because, you know, someone would leave a review. They think it's okay to feel <laughs> trapped because you got someone pregnant. It's true, but that's why I had to clear it up, too. It's like, we've gotten reviews like that. we got to, like, you know... The character type, feels like, trapped. We're talking about a character. <laughs> feels he in his in his mind feels trapped. I'm not saying that every guy who has a pregnant girlfriend feels trapped. I'm just saying the character. <laughs> Are you? Is that what you're saying, James? <laughs> Anyways, and so, unsubscribed. <laughs> and so basically, he's at conflict with himself with being Adam or with being Anthony and and trying to figure out which one he wants to be. And it's sort of like a battle about which personality is going to come out on top at the end. He's, yeah, he's, it's like Gollum and Smeagol. Yeah. Split personality. <laughs> it's great. But the the filmmaking is really brilliant, and I, I love the pacing, and it's just a really engrossing movie. I've seen it a lot, of, and it just still gets better on repeat viewings. And it is a slow movie, but I like that about it. It really takes its time to set it up. Yeah, it's very eerie. Pretty disturbing. The ending is shocking, and it's a great, great film. Denis is one of the best out there today working for sure. Next up, we have another great film, Under the Skin, which came out in 2018, directed by Jonathan Glazer. A mysterious young woman seduces lonely men in the evening hours in Scotland. However, events lead her to begin a process of self-discovery. This is a terrific horror sci-fi film with an unbelievable performance from Scarlett Johansson. I love the filmmaking of this. Jonathan Glazer did a really terrific job. This movie is shocking. This movie is unpredictable, and it is just mind blowing. You, it's you never seen anything like it. It's basically a, a story about an alien who has come to the to Earth to, um, for some reason, break down the the bodies of men to provide what looks to be some kind of either fuel source or food source for her people. Yeah, that is what it is. Not yeah. basic. That's exactly yeah, the plot okay. of the film. So, so I did a great job. ScarJo plays this alien who I love her introduction to the world where like it's like a close-up of her eyeball and you hear her talk and she's like learning to speak like human beings and she's there with another alien who like basically sets her up with that body of that woman who is ScarJo and helps her as she goes across seducing men, learning them with sex into this giant chamber, which Stranger Things definitely took from under the skin. You know, it's cool when Eleven goes into her water place and it's just the black environment, completely blackness, and except for the moisture on the ground that she's walking through, that was taken from this film 100%. Under the Skin did it first. Yeah, so this, this film is it's definitely ahead of its time filmmaking-wise. It's visually stunning. You could probably say it, it might be A24's best film. It's, it's for sure, you could argue it's a masterpiece. It's one of my favorites on this list. And, and, and the... The filmmaking of Jonathan Glazer, he combined that great visual imagery with um, very gritty and guerrilla style filmmaking where a lot of the footage of her walking through the city uh, is just, they shot guerrilla style with the camera, didn't get a, a perimeter or anything. Talking to real people. Yeah. And there's a moment where Scarlett Johansson walks through a, side, a crowded sidewalk and actually trips and that was all planned, but everyone around her is a real person. None of them are actors. And then... A lot of the people, like a lot of the men that she talks to, she, like she talks to them from within her van, like out the window. She'll like drive up to someone and just like say hi to them and just try and entice them to come over. A lot of those guys were actually real people that didn't know that they were being filmed at the time. And obviously they signed the, the release form afterwards. But they managed to get plenty of people who were real non-actors in those shots. But then obviously the people she takes into her lair are obviously actors, but they did a really great job of combining those two elements and styles of filmmaking. Yeah, but what happens to Laura is she's, you know, being this alien disguised as a human who is 
break helping steal and abduct human men and they're being transformed into that go- goopy energy source for the aliens <laughs> She starts to feel human emotions or, or is confused by them or interested in them. And I think the, the first time she sees it is when uh, she sees that person trying to save the other person who was drowning. And then also when she starts to – she tries to lure at first that um, disfigured man who she starts to feel pity for. And so she's starting to develop human emotions. And she tries to have a romantic relationship with that man later on. And it's at that point where the other aliens are trying to get her to kill her probably because she's not supposed to be doing this. Yeah, it's, it's about uh, identity and self-reflection. And this movie, it's it's a great sci-fi movie about an alien, but there's like, there's like no action and there's, you know, there's not that much violence. And it's a really meditative film and I think that they just really knocked it out of the park and there's nothing like it and it has it really has some of the most disturbing images I've ever seen like when the men are in the lair and then they get she's there's this some kind of illusion within the lair which and the floor looks like it's made of water but then as she leads them forward they end up unknowingly going down what seems to be steps down into the water and then before they know it they've been overtaken by this liquid and they fall into this liquid, like it reminds you of like Get Out, where they're trapped under this under this water. And then suddenly, all of the flesh within their body gets sucked out of them, and all that remains is their skin, their empty skin, just floating in the water. And it's some of the most disturbing thing imagery I've ever seen in my life. It's like unbelievable. How quick it is. Too. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like it just gets. Like it's sucked up like a straw. Ter- one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. It's like an empty Capri Sun pouch. <laughs> Legit. Just drained and lifeless. <laughs> and this movie, it's the music to it too is it's so good. It's like genius Make in a, a way. Levi. And and it's it's disturbing, but at times it's also beautiful at the same time. And it's it's really incredible. I think it's one of the best parts of the film. Definitely. You gotta see it, everyone. You guys gotta check it out. Yeah. Next up we have The Lighthouse, directed by Robert Eggers came out in 2018 starring the bat the Battison, robert pat robert pattinson and willem dafoe the goblin two ho- two lighthouse keepers try to maintain their sanity while living on a remote and mysterious new england island in the 1890s and this is a phenomenal movie we've talked about it before on the show with one of our modern horror episodes obviously this is the second time we're talking about robert eggers in this episode because deservedly so he's made two great horror films for a24 so far this movie is fantastic. I love the filmmaking. They shot it digitally, but they, 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 the aspect ratio and also the post production made it look like it was shot on film with an old camera, and it looks really, really stunning. There was no other movie that came out that looked like it that year, and it did get a nomination for cinematography. But this movie, what's so great about it is the acting. Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe are so dynamic together. You never seen either of them like this, and I think Willem Dafoe. Gave one of the best performances I've seen in a long time, like at all, like in general. Just like he, the dialogue he spits out, these huge monologues he goes on of complex yeah. verbiage and yeah, old school dialogue. Just like the witch, people don't talk like this anymore. He's got a pipe in his teeth the whole time, and he's just like he, he's like an, an old sailor. It is unbelievable his performance, and he makes the movie. And I just think him not getting even nominated for anything was just, like, such a big snub that year. Yeah, and for people who are, like, so upset about Robert Pattinson being Batman, they don't think he's a talented actor. You haven't seen movies like The Lighthouse because he's phenomenal in this movie. He's so good. This is easily his best performance he's probably done so far. He plays the character Ephraim, who is, like, the young lighthouse keeper as they both get sent there. And it's a really great dynamic where Wake seems to be like obsessed with this like magical power of the lighthouse. And he, he keeps it for himself in a way, but he never lets Ephraim near it. And they just have this dynamic where they're constantly, at times they're very playful and having fun. But in other times they hate each other's guts. And it's about two people just like who spend way too much time together for too long of a period of time, secluded from the entire entire world and just they both kind of go insane in a way sounds like us in 2020 who <laughs> <laughs> me and you <laughs> yeah with a couple of you know who's yeah, yeah but um in this all like just like the other film we talked about killing of a sacred deer this film was inspired by an ancient myth this time prometheus and proteus and it's about you know prometheus gave humanity the fire and then he was punished by Zeus for it. 
And so essentially the lighthouse is the fire that man is trying to get and Willem Dafoe is trying to guard the fire from humanity. Yeah, so you can say Willem Dafoe's character Wake is like God and then yeah. Ephraim is man who tries to take the fire for himself and mm-hmm. is punished for the rest of eternity. Yeah, and he's a, he even suffers the same fate by spending eternity getting his liver eaten by um, seagulls. For it to be grown again the next day yeah. and to constantly happen forever yeah. for his entire existence. And this movie's a trip. And it's also based loosely on a real lighthouse disappearance where three real lighthouse workers in 1900 just mysteriously disappeared. Well, I mean, if you think about it, like if there's a gigantic storm like that and there's no technology, like how are you going to like let anyone know you're in danger? How are yeah. you, if you, you run out of supplies or something happens, like how are you going to find help? Yeah, there's, but there's no signs of a struggle or anything, like no evidence points to any sort they of just disappeared. Just disappeared. Wow. Probably something like with a storm or taking into the water or maybe they all went crazy and started killing each other. And Oof. Maybe Maybe one survivor was left. Maybe around. one survived, hid their bodies in the water, and then took off. Maybe. Who knows? That's that's what I would say. That that, that would be a good movie. But this movie is stunning. It, it's not for the faint of heart, and it's not for people who don't like weird movies because it doesn't have a traditional plot. It takes its time as it unravels, and there's some weird stuff in this movie, but in the best way possible. Tony Stark is not in this, everybody. Yeah, there's no Marvel quips in it. <clears throat> Moving on to Midsummer, came out in 2019, directed by Ari Aster. Second it's film. Midsommar. No, it's actually Midsummer. That's how you say it? Yeah. Oh. Actually, so can you remove that tone and apologize? It's actually not Midsommar. <laughs> <laughs> and it's about a couple who travels to Scandinavia to visit a rural hometown's fabled Swedish Midsummer Festival. What begins as an idyllic retreat quickly devolves into an increasingly violent and bizarre competition at the hands of a pagan cult. And we've talked about this, I think, also like three times on the show already. We did the, again, the hereditary verse Midsummer episode recently. Check that out for a super in-depth conversation about Midsummer. It's Midsummer we did it last year in our modern horror, for, horror, modern horror episode and love this movie. Shocking disturbing everything about it is phenomenal yeah florence Pugh is amazing and ari aster's directing is really pitch perfect i love how everything's set in daylight because that's what makes the horror even more terrifying just like we said in the shining where when you can see everything clearly that that means nothing bad can happen right yeah but very untrue with this film it's so trippy it's so disturbing it's gruesome and the third act gets going you are just at the edge of your seat it's shocking There's some terrible gore and some crazy situations, and it's a really memorable movie experience for me, and I've seen it, I think, four times now. Yeah, we used to watch it a bunch of movies. Yeah, Midsummer and Hereditary, two main themes of both films are for sure grief, and we can, I'm sure, count on that being a main theme in his next film for sure as well. And this film is also a breakup movie. You know, it's about Danny who's trying to finally move on from her horrible, horrible boyfriend, even though she needs him as a stable foundation after the death of her entire family at the beginning of the film, it's hard for her to move on from that emotional connection that she needs to probably keep surviving. And even though that her, her boyfriend keeps treating her like garbage constantly, you know, forgets her birthday and has he wants to cheat on her and isn't happy, he doesn't want her to come on the trip, doesn't tell her about the trip until she hears about it at a party from someone else and, you know, it's about her moving on from that guy and getting the the last say and con- piece of control in the entire relationship by you know viciously burning him alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got a great attention to detail, like all the symbolism and that you see in the early parts of the film that foreshadow and tell the audience what's going to happen to certain characters. And when everything comes together, you are just blown away. It's got one of my favorite endings in a long time, and I definitely agree. It's such a great breakup movie. And I think Danny's transformation is vital to the film working, her losing everything, losing her family, and then gaining a new family in the terms of this pagan cult. Yeah. You can interpret it if you want, whether it's insanity at the end, but, you know, we talked about this a lot. So go check out those other episodes, the Hereditary Midsummer episode, for way more discussion on both of those films. So much discussion. And let's move on to... It Comes at Night. This was directed by Trey Edward Schultz, 2017. Secure within a desolate home as an unnatural threat terrorizes the world, a man has established a tenuous domestic order with his wife and son. Then a desperate young family arrives seeking refuge. This movie, it's pretty good. I liked it a lot. There are some cons to it for sure, but I think the biggest con for me and for both of us is that the trailer 
makes it seem like a completely different film than what you actually watch. You know, the trailer seems to make it feel like a monster movie, like something's coming. Even the title, something's coming at night. And I, I understand that for the film, it is really, you could argue, fear or like fear of the unknown. That's what it is. I do agree with you because the movie does work. And the first time watching it, I was totally into it. I was very much uh, engrossed by it and I was dying to see what happened. But then when the third act came around and that really grim ending and then you saw what really was going on, it was underwhelming. And if a lot of people feel that way, this movie has an 87% Rotten Tomato score by the critics, but then a 44% score by the audience. So it just pissed people off. Yeah, a lot of people, myself included, we, we, I felt like the marketing misled us and that the trailer seemed so great and intriguing and the name is very cool. And then when that wasn't really delivered, I also felt like, oh, that's it. I mean, they that, got us into the theater. Yeah. But, you know. And the, the, it was building to something that you thought was going to be really, really memorable. But then it kind of just went out with a whimper and you were like, oh, man, that's how it ends. Like, that's it. So I also was left underwhelmed by the ending of this film. Yeah, because really what we find out is there's no monster. You know, there isn't like this giant beast, although the director like kind of has moments where like there are some sounds in the woods that like, is, is there actually a monster? Who knows? And he's like, it's up for the... Uh, it's for the audience member to determine, which is interesting. But you know, I'd rather know if there's if it's a monster movie or not. I think you need you need to draw a line in the sand of what kind of film it is. You yeah, know, but it's also, a little too ambiguous. But there are things that are so inexplicable that lead the audience on in an unfair way. Like for example, like the dream sequences, like those nightmares the kid has, and makes it seem like he's might be like seeing things or being possessed by things, or and then also when the dog is found like slaughtered on the floor and and ultimately you discover that the dog probably did it to itself because it was going wild because of the infection and from the virus it had and things like that make it seem like things were causing this to ha all these things to happen something was causing all these things to happen and that kind of felt like it, it was all empty moments that led us to like this twist that we never would have seen it coming because it was set up to be impossible. Yeah, well, it's it's a twist. It's like it isn't a thing. It's it's a disease that's spreading. Probably, I think through the film, it's it's insinuated that it's being spread through the water supplies in the area, and and the characters. Obviously, the father played by Joel Edgerton is has that tenuous domestic order where he they, they filter their own water and boil it so that they don't get any get any sickness. They wear masks and gloves a lot, so it's actually relevant. The precursor to, to 2020. 2020. It's kind of funny. Um, and yeah, it's, I think the plot's totally fine and interesting if that's what we were led to believe that the film's about because they make it seem like it's something else, which, you know, I get it. You want you want people to come see your movie. I get it. I think the movie would have worked better if they were open, like you said, without trying to be mysterious and make it more of like survival drama and also trying the, the dynamic between this new family that has entered the home and just being able to try to trust other people, that would have been more interesting. Because that's exactly what happens yeah. if they just focus on that more. That's because, the, those are the best elements of the movie. Yeah, because it's ironic where putting your trust in somebody kind of led to the fall of both families and to the death of everybody in the film because mm -hmm. if they never met, if they never came asking for help, look, they would have never gotten them sick. And then if the Edgerton's family didn't trust them to come and you know be safe with them and and not cause a cause a fuss you could say then you know everything would have been fine but because you they lose trust later on and it's about who's sick you can't tell who's sick for 24 hours for symptoms to show so then it, obviously everybody gets sick because you know yeah it's, it's gonna happen now at some point there's a movie it was called z for zachariah with margot robbie and she would tell you for and chris pine and it is about survive three survivors in a home um and the dynamic that happens between them in a post-apocalyptic world world that embraces the idea of just the, the the relationships are the conflicts, and there's nothing like monstrous happening or mysterious happening. And yeah. I think they did a better job with that. Well, one. I still like this movie though. I it's, think it's, it's cool. It's well made and well acted. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's it's a good time. Um, so we got two more left on this list. The first one is probably I haven't seen a Human Centipede, but I would say for me personally, this Tusk. Directed by Kevin Smith, came out in 2014. Probably the most disturbing film I've ever seen in my entire life. This movie makes me lose my appetite even just from thinking about it. It's about a brash and arrogant podcaster played by Justin Long. So he's like us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that arrogant. Gets more than he bargained for when he travels to Canada to interview a Where? <laughs> Did I say? I said Canada. Yeah. Canada. 
<laughs> Canada, mate. That's Australia. <laughs> hey, I, I say know, a. a. A, that's what it is. Canada, A. Canada, A, to interview a mysterious recluse who has a rather dis- rather disturbing fondness for wall walruses i can't talk today that was a great summary for walruses (laughs) thanks for that clean description it's pretty pretty choppy everyone's like what is this movie about some guy goes to canada he's a podcaster and interviews someone who likes walruses yeah it's kevin smith he actually did make a horror movie before this he made red state which is a pretty good horror film this movie like you said it disturbed the hell out of me i I actually it's so disturbing i don't want to watch it again me neither because the third act it just it gets under my skin just thinking about it it makes me squeamish It's, it's that body horror that body gore that I don't have a great time dealing with in terms of like, I don't want to watch the human centipede. I don't want to see that. And, you know, I'm glad I saw Tusk because it's really, it's a great horror film. He did it like Kevin Smith. This is the best movie. Yeah, for sure. It's his best 100%. one. And Justin Long is awesome. This is one of his better, it's probably his best performance. And it's an amazing villain. And Johnny Depp is hilarious in this movie. He plays the the private detective on the hunt trying to find him but this movie it just really messes with you and in a good way if you love this kind of stuff and i know a lot of people really adore this film and if you love this kind of horror this is right up your alley yeah so let, let's get into what actually happens in this movie <laughs> because it's so messed up so this character played by justin long he travels to canada because he's trying to you know find some interesting stories to talk about on his podcast and then because i guess the internet isn't yeah, good enough then he you know he's he's having a drink with this guy that he's talking to in Canada at his house passes out, wakes up in a wheelchair and one of his legs has been amputated and apparently the guy tells him you got bit by this poisonous spider so I had to amputate your leg in order to save your life. And at that point, I'm I'm in at that point because it hasn't gone that far yet. This is like super interesting and terrifying. Like this is, this is crazy. This is a cool movie. And then we learn about his fondness, the other man's fondness for walruses. And it's ironic that the character's name is Wallace mm-hmm. by Justin, so it's kind of funny. Um, and his motivation for bringing Wallace there is to turn him into a walrus man. And so over the course of the next several days, he keeps performing these surgeries on Wallace and then letting him heal. And then eventually, by the third act of the film, Justin Long's character has now physically resembled a walrus he is like literally a walrus made from human flesh and it's got he's got the tusks he's got like all the extra body fat for the mass he's got the tail he's got the flippers i don't think it's 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 like part walrus uh, material too right yeah yeah Yeah. i think so maybe yeah it's not all human because humans don't have tusks so he like uses real yeah yeah, yeah. a real walrus walrus body suit yeah but it is and once and then it's a matter of wallace like trying to get out of there and then his friends and Johnny Depp's character eventually discover him and it is so messed up it's crazy yeah it's unbelievable it's, it's, it's so so disturbing like when he wakes up to being a walrus and he can't even speak he just can only scream like the most horrible terrifying scream you could ever imagine screaming in your life and mm-hmm. it's just so disturbing to even just imagine something like that happening to yourself obviously it's not possible but yeah. it's freaking disturbing and he ends up killing the guy because he also puts on his own walrus suit and they battle. Yeah. And he kills Tusk it. battle. It is it is crazy. I'm getting like sick to my stomach just talking about it. Yeah. It's pretty disturbing. Oof. Probably the most effed up movie I've ever seen in my entire life. It is wow. Kevin Smith got the jo- job done. What what he oh, was yeah, trying sure. what he was trying to do, he did it. He pulled it, it is, off. It's freaking crazy. Yeah. Man. But uh, if you're, in, you're into that kind of stuff, you would love Tusk. If you don't have a summer for it, I don't recommend watching it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't ever want to see it again. <laughs> but let's cheer up with a great movie for the final one. Yeah. And that's going to be A Ghost Story, directed by David Lowry, 2017. Mike Lowry. <laughs> in this singular exploration of legacy, love, loss, and the enormity of existence, a recently deceased white-sheeted ghost returns to his suburban home to try to reconnect with his bereaved wife. This is a brilliant Um, depiction of ghosts because rather than characters being tormented by a ghost we follow the perspective of a ghost and what's really interesting is David Lowry also included time how time would pass for a ghost and in his in his in his world that he built you know time is like kind of like a circle it kind of reminds you of arrival where Casey Affleck plays the deceased man who is now a ghost and he first starts out observing his wife 
observing her as her and her daughter grow up. And time seems to be uncontrollable to him. It's like first days will pass and then years will pass and then centuries will pass and then he'll be back t- back in time and then he'll be traveling, he'll be forward in time. And so it seems as though time for the dead who haven't passed on to the afterlife is all over the place. And it seems to be like ev- like a different dimension of time in a way. Yeah, it's not linear. Yeah. And it, it, he only spends time in the area where his home was with his wife. And I love 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 this movie the first time i saw it i was absolutely blown away i think it's a hidden gem out there borderline masterpiece in filmmaking it's not exactly a horror film but you know it's It's a ghost ghost story story. and you know it's more about life after death existence reality our souls you know what happens after you're after we die and you know that whole concept of a ghost and what it's what it could be like you know thinking about the afterlife and what, what would your perspective be like in a ghost and i love the concept of just Put a sheet on him. It's a sheet. It's Casey Affleck in a sheet. It's really him under there. It's not like a standard or anything. It's really Casey Affleck. And he was filming this movie the entire time. And what I love about it is it's so silly looking and like, you know, homemade Halloween costume. They were way. definitely like, we hope this works, I bet. But that's what that's what I think. I think it works because he doesn't really interact too much with things in the world, in the physical world. Like sometimes he does create situations with the lighting or bangs and when he's upset. But for the most part, he's just kind of just standing around. You know, he sometimes, you know, he pulls the note out of the wall and everything like that. But it's just a really interesting concept to just look at the perspective of a ghost underneath a sheet. And also, if they had done some kind of special effects or visual effects with CGI to make him look like effervescent and like flowy and maybe even he doesn't even need to like stand up, maybe the movie wouldn't have worked. I think the movie works because it actually is, you know, just Casey Affleck standing there in a sheet because... I, I, something about that image of that, it seems like kind of welcoming, like the ghost isn't dangerous and the ghost isn't like something to be afraid of. And I think that allows the audience to connect to it. It seems human in a way. Yeah. And the thing with his character is he's remaining here because he dies unexpectedly in that car crash, but he doesn't want to move on. He still wants to have a life with his wife and he, you know, he, he watches her and watches her as she's moved, trying to move on in her life, trying to like date other people, which he doesn't find he's not happy about and watching her with like that pie scene is one of the most emotional things i've ever seen in a movie before and the thing about it is it's like a, it's like a seven minute scene of rooney mara eating a pie in one take one shot her on the kitchen floor doing it and the thing about it is it's it's like the most vulnerable you'll ever see somebody in a movie because it's one of those things that it feels like it's not supposed to like be seen if, if that makes sense, it's like a part of vulnerability that you, you things that we do on our own that we do in yeah. real life that you don't want anyone seeing. Like oh, I'm going to eat an entire box of hog and dogs or chocolates or I'm just so <laughs> on the floor on the floor. Like I mean, you never see that in a it's movie. Like David Hasselhoff eating his burger on this bathroom you, floor. Yeah, well, he was drunk as <laughs> f. That's different. I'm, we're talking about grief here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. But um, yeah, we've seen people like pounding pints of ice cream but for seven minute one take never seen anything like that before because that's what it's really like yeah it makes you feel like you're there in that moment with her yeah you just feel the vulnerability of her character and it's just it's really moving and i think that's a that scenes like that are, are how he's trying to communicate grief and moving on to the audience and then also since time isn't linear eventually he doesn't even seem to control where and when he when he is because it gets to the point where he's at a time where the house wasn't even built yet and it's like the 1600s or like well, the 1700s. Have, yeah, so that's because he waits for, we can assume it's a couple hundred years yeah. at that existence. And now it's like this small town is a super city in the yeah. future with yeah. skyscrapers. And then it seems like he's living this futile existence. And that's when he jumps off that skyscraper. And that's when he gets transported back in time. So he can't even kill himself even yeah. though he wants to die. And the thing with him is he's not able to pass on because he hasn't accepted what's happening. He can't move on because he needs closure. And what he needs to do is eventually what he tried to do earlier in the film is try to get the note outside of the frame of the wall that his wife hid inside there for just to keep there forever to a way for her to communicate with him in the afterlife. Exactly. It's, it's an unbelievable film. And telling it from the perspective of the actual ghost, and it's different from like other movies where like the others or the orphanage because you know they still look like us but i just really think that david lowry what he did with this film was wholly unique never seen anything like it before 
And it really stunned me when I saw it. Yeah, and he also made a movie called Ain't Them Body Saints with Casey Affleck and Rooney Mara. And I think yeah, that, that came up before this. Yeah. And I love how he used them again in this film because it really gives the feeling of an actual relationship because, you know, they have a great working relationship. They probably care about each other very much off on set and in real life. So you really get the feeling that it's real. Yeah. David Lowry has also done Pete's Dragon, and then he did The Green Knight. So he has an unbelievably eclectic and fantastic filmography so far. Fantastic director. The yeah. Green Knight was phenomenal. I hope you all saw it in theaters because it was truly an incredible cinematic experience. And Pete's Dragon is one of the most underrated kids' movies of the last several years. Yeah, we years. know. You've said that like seven times You haven't seen it. you got to watch it. It's <laughs> really good. Maybe I will. You would love it. Is you... it animated? No, it's live action. Oh, live action dragon yeah. movie? Yeah, with Robert Redford and a couple other great actors. Oh, Robert Bry Redford's Bry in it? Bryce Dallas Howard's in it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Wes Bentley. Because he worked with Robert Redford on that other movie he made about the the, boat. the, old, yeah. the, the bank robber. Yeah. yeah, The Old Man and the Gun. Yeah. That's a cool movie. Yeah, very good. But you would love Pete's Dragon. It's I'm, great. I probably you would. You should watch it. I like David Lowry. He's pretty cool. Really? Anyways, Ghost Story. Check it out. Unbelievable movie. Phenomenal. Yeah. And that wraps our episode on A24 Horror Films. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. I feel like we got to revisit like another A24 segment again because they still have another ton of great dramas and sci-fi films that we haven't talked oh, about. Oh, yeah. They're still so young, too. But I was I was looking at their filmography, and it's like from 2013 to like 2016, a few movies here and there. But then after like 2017, they just exploded, and they came out with a ton of films. I think their first movie, wasn't it Spring Breakers? Or that was, was one, an early one. That was like their yeah. one of their first one five. Of their, yeah. That was one of those yeah, early, early A twenty four films. Yeah. So I mean I can't wait to see what more the studio has to come to for, You've come for, to know you you expect quality when you see their movies. Yeah. You know what I mean? I expect every time I see A twenty four, not just quality, but something thought provoking. And something different. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's pretty like cool. Like a, a lamb human. The Lamb Human Baby, which we're going to go see this weekend. It's going to be awesome. I <laughs> hope you all see Lamb 2 as well in theaters. And I know a lot of you guys guys and gals are A24 fans because this is people have been requesting to, us to do A24 episodes. So hope you enjoyed this one. We're going to do uh, more of their films in the future for yeah. sure. Yeah, we got to do like a Safety Brothers episode with uh, Good Time and Uncut Gems. We, I want to do some a sci-fi episode of A24 because of films like, like High Life is Awesome. That's a great sci-fi film, space travel and stuff. And you know, they have a ton of great stuff. And we, we got to do The Lobster sometime. We love oh, that yeah. movie. Oh, yeah. So thanks so, again so much for tuning in to our A24 episode. Be sure to become a patron today to help support the show and keep our lights on for this podcast at Raiders of the Lost Pod. No, at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. And thanks so much for tuning in around the world. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe if you're new. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.